Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to tell you about a place where you can find more horror stories. But not like the, the way that you hear them here, they're like, they're like ones with pictures. Tonight's video is sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is loaded with thousands of hours of binge-worthy supernatural, thriller, and horror shows, as well as horror movies, and there's always something new to watch or a classic to rediscover. Shudder is incredible for fans of horror and thrillers, especially in a time when it's tough to find good quality horror all in one place. I mean, I, I know that I've gone through this struggle. I'm pretty sure that all of you have. Any subscription service that you have, you're trying to find horror movies, it's the same eight ones and they all suck. But with Shudder, there are weekly releases and hundreds of exclusive shows that you won't find anywhere else. Shudder is commercial free and available for just $5.99 a month, which is the cheapest subscription service I've seen out of like literally all of them. I watch Shudder and it's super easy to be able to stream because I can get it on my phone, iPads. They hook up to my television Roku player, which makes it just simple to watch in the living room. And I, I can't watch them going to bed because my wife gets upset if I watch horror movies uh, when she's trying to sleep. A show that literally just premiered back on January 10th was Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitched. It's a history of folk horror. If you guys have been interested in any of those past little deep dives I've done into cryptids, um, or the like, th this is definitely going to be a show for you. I think that you guys would really enjoy this one, as well as, like, I mean, God, there's countless ones to watch on Shudder now. So if you want to be able to check that out and many, many of the other shows, then you can try Shudder for free for 30 days by going over to Shudder.com and using promo code CREEPYPASTA. Join me and quite literally, I think, every other horror creator, because we all talk about Shudder and we've all used it and we all watch it. So keep up to date, folks. And now, on to tonight's story. The ad offered $5,000, said that the desired activity could be completed within an hour, stated fairly redundantly that it wasn't a sexual thing, and insisted that all the witness would need to do is sit in a chair, stare ahead. The only other details expressed were that you couldn't move during the experience, nor could you talk. This inability being out of a requested self-restraint, not through any means of physical prevention. Being an abysmally broke college student and having a friend whom I could depend on for my rescue, if something strange happened, I answered the ad in only a few minutes after coming across it. The person who had put the ad out had provided a phone number, which I called. Sending a text resulted in me being informed that it was a landline. The person answered... We briefly discussed the location where the interaction was to be held, and I confirmed the amount of money to be paid. Like his ad, he repeatedly reminded me that it was in no way a carnal activity. Apparently, he would gotten a lot of answers to the ad from people with that particular preconception. My friend took the day off from work, insisted, despite my protests that we could wait until the following day when he was off, and we drove to the agreed-upon location. It was a house in a suburban neighborhood, which was somewhat comforting, the man was an axe murderer, and there was a chance my screams of terror could be heard by quite a few people. I joked aloud about this, but my friend didn't find it funny. The ad specified, and the man reiterated that I be alone when entering the house, so I had my friend stay in the car. Being similarly broke, I offered him $5,000 for his help, an unnecessary incentive, his words, to not leave me if the man turns out to be truly insane. I got out of the car and walked across the lawn, which, unlike those of the other houses, hadn't been maintained. The grass was high, the weeds threatened to burst through the concrete of the driveway and sidewalk. The man had sounded fairly old on the phone, so I attributed the ill-maintained property to an inability to perform the duties, rather than some indication of insanity. I was instructed to immediately enter once I had arrived, so I didn't bother knocking. The unlocked door opened into a foyer and connected to this was a hall that led into a kitchen. The hall held a single door, which I assumed led into a closet or down to a basement. Leftward from the kitchen was a spacious room devoid of furnishing, save for two steel foldable chairs and an equally foldable dining table. The foyer, hall, and kitchen were in similar states of barrenness, and aren't worth remarking on beside that. Sitting in one of the chairs in the great room was a man, I knew at once to be the dealer of the ad. There was a certain familiarity about him, one of those times when a voice is an almost eerie reflection of the person from whom it's issued. He nodded and he gave a wave, but it didn't speak. 
I approached and sat down at the chair opposite him. To my left on the dinner table was a box. Top of the box was a clear case, through which a neat stack of money could be seen. The base of the box was black with a timer at its face and a clasping mechanism which sealed the upper portions to the bottom. It's a time release device. Now that you're here, I'll start it. He immediately does. And once an hour's passed from this point, the box will open. You're free to take your payment. You needn't say anything once that time arrives. You can depart a slightly richer person. <laughs> now all you have to do is look at me. You may, of course, blink. But please do not speak or look away. It's very important that you be both silent and still. And so the staring process began. I was expectantly awkward for the first few minutes. He stared right back at me, but after a while, the oddness of the circumstances became dull, and I grew accustomed to them. His face wasn't unusual, but it wasn't exactly handsome, easy enough to look at, but not someone you would have necessarily wanted to linger on without incentive. He was about 65, hair grayed and thin, face starting to sag, blue eyes slightly squinting, visual acuity, no doubt dwindling. Despite his incessant assertion, to the contrary, I couldn't help but think that he derived some abstract sexual amusement from this. Some sort of staring into the eyes of your lover thing, but despite the incredibly uncomfortable experience of that hour, so to be described, he at no point exhibited any behavior which would suggest arousal. After ten minutes in, the strangeness of the experience was doubled. From below and then far beyond me, I heard a shifting clamor, as if a group of people had ascended the basement stairs and gathered just before the kitchen, chanting excitedly. I was going to turn, the ad hadn't mentioned the presence of others, but the man's eyes seemed to almost plead with me to remain focused on him. He didn't speak a word, though. Resisting instinct, I kept my gaze fixed on him and listened to the noise of the crowd behind me. The weird thing was that while I could hear them talking and even mentally differentiate between speakers, I couldn't understand a word that was spoken. They had moved into the kitchen by this point, but none of the words were intelligible to me, and even weirder was that it was obvious they were speaking English. I mean, I could recognize the nuance, the structure of the language. The man's eyes imparted nothing beyond the unspoken insistence that I keep mine on him. My inability to recognize the words which were clearly English troubled me greatly, and I... I started saying words in my head to reassure myself that I had not somehow forgotten the language. Couldn't check exactly how much time had passed, timer being too far out of my peripheral vision, but about... Forty minutes into the experience, the voices were right behind me, in the great room. There were perhaps twelve distinct voices, all chattering and laughing and speaking some unrecognizable variants of a language I had been speaking for nearly two decades. Women, men, and children conversed just behind me, not a single one for even a moment being understandable. I was terrified. Their, their appearance and migration from the basement to the right behind me it was strange, yeah, but... The possibility that something was wrong with me, that I might have had some sort of stroke or neurological slip-up was far worse. My eyes had stayed on the man, but my mind had momentarily receded, turning over these bleak possibilities. Upon returning my focus to the man, I saw that he was crying. Inaudibly, of course, but the tears were there, the lips slightly quivering. Instinct almost compelled me to ask what was wrong, but I stopped myself both for the sake of the experience and a new fear that speaking would somehow draw the attention of the partiers to me. And for some inexpressible reason, I was sure that getting their attention wasn't something I wanted. A new terror dawned then. I mean, what if the group continues their movements and they press forward, swarming around us? With each second that passed, I grew more certain that seeing these people would cause something horrible to happen. Their voices did grow louder, but no closer in proximity. I started to shake, my heartbeat quickened, my breathing became labored. I tried to calm myself, but the presence of those people behind me was so dreadful. 
in a way that I still can't find the words to properly describe. Against my control, as I shuddered, I let out a low moan. It was barely audible, more of a release of air than proper emission of the vocal cords, but the man's eyes grew wide with terror, and from behind me, for the first time, I heard something I could understand. Oh, would someone like to join the party? I froze in place. Even my heart seemed to quiet its movements. The noise behind me still continued, but with considerably less people causing it. The attention of several members had apparently been drawn from the conversation. Drawn to me. I became like a statue, not even allowing myself to blink. The man's eyes remained wide, but he'd stopped crying. He stared at me with what I can only describe as mindless terror. Despite my earlier belief that seeing these people would bring about some horrible event, I tried to see within his eyes even a dim reflection of the scene behind me, but nothing was reflected. Not even his thoughts. I could have sworn I heard a request to join the party. A woman's voice. I think it was one of dear old dad's friends, the man said. <laughs> that fool couldn't keep a friend of his life dependent on it. You two sure saw to that. A third voice. Another man. A chorus of disconcerting laughter erupted. Oh well, should we go back downstairs? The others, who hadn't spoken, seemed to respond in agreement, although I couldn't understand them. As gradually as they had come, the voices went away, returning downstairs and eventually fading to inaudibility. A few minutes later, the timer beside us went off, indicating that the hour had passed. The man almost collapsed at this moment, sagging back in his seat and breathing raggedly. I went to help him, but he held up a hand, dismissing me. Before I could say anything, he cried out, Thank you, and repeated the same multiple times between breaths. He started crying again, although these tears seemed to be from relief or maybe even joy. After a few moments of this, he recovered himself and he sat upright in his chair. He gestured to the box and said, Money's yours. You're free to go. Thank you sincerely for accompanying me during this time. For noticing me. Please, take the money and leave this place. I'll be heading out myself soon enough. Despite the utterly bizarre experience, I didn't want to ask any questions. That migratory horde of partiers had scared the shit out of me. I didn't want to remain in the home longer than I had to. I grabbed and I pocketed the money, not bothering to count it, and I walked away, waving behind me as I went. Made my exit as quickly and quietly as possible. Closed the door, relieved that I hadn't heard rushing footsteps ascending the stairs. My friend was still parked outside, right where I left him. I got in the car and let out the heaviest sigh of my life. Guess he was a no-show, huh? Not surprised. No one just gives away five grand. What are you talking about? I took the money out of my pocket and showed it to him. He looked at the money, then to me with an expression of incredulity. But you were only in there for five minutes! Did you steal it? I laughed. Kind of nervous laugh you let out when someone says something extremely odd, or after you just survived some perilous experience. In my case, either one could have been the cause. I eventually composed myself and said, What are you talking about? I was in there for an hour. The money was in a locked box with a timer set for that exact amount of time. My friend's expression went from one of disbelief to worry as he pointed at the clock on his radio. I remembered what time it had been when I first left the car. I saw that only five minutes had passed since then. I stared at the clock, then turned my gaze to the money as if it somehow reconciled disparity in the perceptions of time. What exactly happened in there? He asked this softly, which made me feel even worse. I didn't want him to think I was crazy or that I, I had hurt someone and stolen the money, but to avoid the former suspicion, I, I couldn't tell him what actually happened. I looked around. First of the house, and the rest of the neighborhood, but saw no excess of cars, which 
wouldn't account for the presence of the partiers. Also, it was noon on a Tuesday, not exactly the prime circumstances for a party. Please just drive. I wanted to get away from the house. Not until you tell me what happened. Firmer, but not yet confrontational. I took a moment to consider my options. Then I told him a version of the truth that didn't make me sound crazy. I didn't mention anything about the roving crowd of people. I told him about the experience with the man. He said that it must have seemed longer than it really was, or that maybe he set the timer wrong. My friend listened quietly, and once I had finished, he sat silently for a moment, staring at the house through my window. I thought he was going to accept my answer, but without saying anything, he got out of the car. Before I could stop him, he jogged across the lawn and went into the house. I should have gone with him, but my nerves prevented me from re-entering. He returned a few minutes later, silently entering and starting the car. Well, I really meant, well, what did he say? It was empty. Completely empty. No one was inside. There wasn't even a single piece of furniture. I pulled away from the curb and started driving down the street. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing. He dropped me off in my house without saying another word. I don't know what happened to me in that house, but the money is real enough. I've already used some of it to buy food. My, f my friend didn't want any of it. I mean, I can understand that, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what he believes. I don't know what e even I believe. <laughs> but hopefully he didn't think I did something terrible. Maybe he thinks I made the whole thing up. Although there's... There's no way I would have been able to gather $5,000 together. Certainly not for some prank. Regardless of the truth, the money's real. And for that, I'm thankful. Good evening once again, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I want to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Or for listening to tonight's episode of the podcast that's available on Spotify or on Apple Music or on uh, um, any any other places that you can get podcasts. I'm not I'm not entirely sure where people listen to podcasts. Uh, if you guys are watching on YouTube, though, I would really appreciate if you click the subscribe button, click that thumbs up button, and hit the bell for me because that's what we're supposed to say now. We're required by YouTube law. As always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, and you allow us to get a whole bunch of custom stories that are only heard here on this channel, on this podcast. So, a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Payne Gravy, Inactive Hermit, Austin Johnson, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Maria Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Micah Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Suzaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Miss Xander, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. And of course, everybody who's down there in the description as well, and everybody who can support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta for even $1, I appreciate it greatly, and I'm sure that all the authors that we were able to work with appreciate it too. So, thank you guys so much, thank you for listening, and sweet dreams.